the same constructs that made me a very good professional athlete and really detailed oriented and focused on winning. And this is what it takes to be better. And this is how we win. Also make me hypercritical of myself and want to punish myself in a way that's not healthy. It's hard to know that that's what made me great. And I don't want that for my kids. It was scary. It's a scary thing. And in talking about what little shadow work I've actually done, and it's it's ego. My ego is going to take over and I'm going to revert back to that old, you know, shithead, that old guy who's going to try to win everything, win every argument. That's a hard switch to shut off. And to be the best in the world, you have to have that switch. I now know I can do that without being that guy. I can do that and be proud of those things, knowing that ain't me anymore. A lot of this stuff, we look back and we act in a way that maybe we're not proud of is unconscious. Being able to turn that stuff on when the situation calls for it, when it's appropriate and not have that be your default mode all the time. I've got eight months to the Olympics and these were going to be my Olympics. I was going to be the Olympic champion. I'd signed a deal. If I won gold, I was going to be on the cover of the Wheaties box. Like all that stuff was laid out for me. And I wake up out of surgery and I can't even move my fingers. And I'm just bawling. I'm like, this is it. There's no way. I sat with myself, thought about who I was as a man, who is Trey Hardy and what kind of person do I want to be a year from now? What kind of person do I want to be five years from now? What kind of person do I want to look back on? Is this a story I want to tell my kids? Is this a story that I'm going to regret on my deathbed? And I knew that the only thing I could control was my attitude. I made a commitment at that moment. What happens if I just have a good time and like enjoy that process and be happy that I'm there? It's what we're all searching for. Can I just be present for this experience? Being that puma that couldn't hunt anymore and not being able to touch my fingers together to standing on a podium with a silver medal around my neck a little over 10 months later, to find the rest of my career, not because of the medal, but because of that journey and that lesson. That works on any level. That works on parenting. That works in, in fatherhood. That works on your relationship with your significant other. That works. The alternative is living a life of regret. I'm so fulfilled and, and so full from that experience because I can look back and proudly tell that story of getting second place. Trey Hardy, this is this is a long time coming. And you're one of the first people um, I met. We met down at On It. And I remember our mutual friend, Big Tom Engwald, um, had told me about you. And, and Kevin Booth, who mm-hmm. is my connection to Tom, was, you know, you got to meet Trey. He's a great guy, so on and so forth. And we were down there. It was like a Saturday workout or something. It was like, I think it was the only one I ever went to, actually. Mm-hmm. And then we connected and, you know, it was, I would say it it took a little while until, you know, we really got to spend a lot of time together, but brother, like just, you know, I would say within the last year Mm -hmm. or so, it's probably been a little bit longer since you started coming to the Wednesday workouts when we had the big crew. And, um, just from, from where I sit, um, which is pretty close to you, just to see, to be witness to your growth and how open you are to, you know, listen, to question it all the way you've done, you know, that's going to obviously the, the theme here of my podcast. And I've just, I've just loved your, your energy and your curiosity, your honesty, your integrity. Go on. Yeah, <laughs> it is. It's, 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 <laughs> It's, it's pretty, it's, it's pretty sweet to marvel at how I've gotten to know you and how you really lead with your heart and, and watching you like kind of undo those agreements you made long ago, the, the agreements that got you to be four time world's top athlete, you know, you, you need to do things that um, today you wouldn't necessarily do. And I remember particularly, obviously, that after one of the first couple of workouts, you came up to me. And it was just such a reminder of like why we were doing that workout group and, and why I'm continued, you know, kind of 
inspired to do this podcast and host our much more intimate Wednesday group. But you came up and um, you gave me one of your amazing hugs and started to share. And you got really emotional and said something to the effect of, I didn't know I needed this, but boy, I need this. And just for people who don't know about the Wednesday workouts, we would come to my house and, you know, at a certain point we got into the forties, the number of men that would show up. Yeah, it was big. And we managed it, but there was no business talk. There was people that didn't really know what anybody did. And that was the beauty of it. Mm -hmm. Right. We just came here. We were, we were in community with other men. We were working out, we're having fun, listening to great music. Guys were connecting within their, you know, their, their group of three. And then guys would linger and, and sometimes guys would go out for taco deli or, or whatever, but just the, again, the energy around what was created there, you felt it. And I remember we had a kind of a long talk after that. And I'd love for you to share because I could recount that, but I'd love to hear from you for, for everyone listening. What was going on for you at that moment? What was coming up for you? Yeah. Ah, uh, goodness. That was a, probably a little more than 12 months ago, right at, right at a year ago. And, you know, I don't want to, to gloss over what, you know, where I was. I think we can get into it, but just for people who, who aren't familiar with you too, just, I want to give them a, just a, a little bit of a clearer picture of your, your athletic achievements. So you were a two-time Olympian, 2008, 2012. You won the silver in 2012 in London in the decathlon. And we're going to get deep into that story. Um, four-time U.S. champ. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then um, four-time considered top athlete in the world. Yeah, num number one ranked. Yeah. Yeah. Like in, I think our good friend Boyd put it, but like I was, I was a Puma, you know, I was a Jaguar and I could hunt and I, I was just looking back. It's really cool. The stuff I got to do, I was as peak physical condition as, as a human can get, you know, in terms of, of skill and athleticism and measurability of that. That's what kind of what the decathlon is. It's a, a crucible of athleticism and it, you know, going back to Jim Thorpe, that's where the moniker came from. And the Swedish king handed him his gold medal in 1912 after he won the Olympic all around, which was then, you know, the first iteration of the modern decathlon. And he just said, you, sir, are the world's greatest athlete. You know, he just beat the pants off of everybody in a bunch of different events. And he got this, this name from this, this official And the U S has had a great tradition in that and tons of just great torchbearers that I could look to. Uh, as I, you know, embarked on that journey and tried to maximize my own human potential. And I was just really fortunate, man. Like a lot of this stuff is just right place, right time. And the things that made me really good were gifts I was given, whether that be a physical gift, I'm tall, or I can run fast. I've got great levers or just the gift of being brought up in the household I was brought up in and being um, given the mental models and tools and work ethic by looking at my, my parents you know, and, you know, a year ago I was four years removed from having, having retired from athletics and retirement's a weird word. Um, has this like connotation of out to pasture and all that stuff. But I was at the time, not ready to admit I was struggling and not ready to like work at any of this, like, and really put in any kind of effort toward becoming the man I was supposed to be, um, being a better father, a better husband, and just being really being myself. You know, my, I'd done a, a, what I would consider a really good job, not a, attaching my self-worth and my identity to what I was. And I was really good at it. Um, I had a life outside of track. I had, you know, a very grounded household. If you went into my house at any given mo point, really up until two months ago, you would have no idea what I did professionally, formally, there's no medals. There's nothing on the, on the walls. There is now because I have a much better relationship with it. We just moved out to, out to Driftwood, Texas. And I actually have a room where like, you know what, it was cool that I did these things. And I have these little tokens that show I did that. And it's not like there's no medals on the wall, but 
there's like shoes that I wore on the metal stand or, you know, a hall of honor plaque thing from the university of Texas. There's just stuff that I can look at and be like, yeah, that was, that was neat. But back to, well, and I, by the way, I, I love that. I think that's such an important part, your relationship to it. And I think we've all gone into homes when the relationship is a bit off and there's an attachment and there's a longing for that. And you see the stuff up there and it carries a completely different energy, Mm -hmm. you know, and and for you, you know, that was a bit in the shadow for you until you, until you developed that relationship. So you didn't want to put it out there because it was was probably, I mean, it was probably painful on some level. You hadn't made peace with it. It was scary. It's a scary thing. And and talking about any, you know, what little shadow work I've actually done. And it's, it's ego. That's a big, scary thing that if I put this out there, my ego is going to take over and I'm going to revert back to that old, you know, shithead, that old guy who's going to try to win everything, win every argument, win every, who could put their dishes up faster. Like that's a hard switch to shut off and to be the best in the world. You have to have that switch. You have to, I, it's like, I'm trying to think like the old, like Michael Jordan, Larry Bird, horse McDonald's commercials. Like that was me, man. Like if we're going to, if we're sitting here doing this podcast, it's like, I'm going to finish my shake before Cal. I'm going to do this before Cal. There was that part of it that assigned a lot of like validity to how I acted because it was a necessity. And then putting that stuff up on the wall. I, I, I now know I can do that without being that guy. I can do that and be proud of those things, knowing that ain't, that ain't, that ain't me anymore, you know? And that was the struggle was I knew that wasn't me. I wasn't connected to it in that way, but I, I was terrified of what it could become if it was up there. Um, and yeah, I mean, still working through it there. I mean, I, I wish there was like, I could write the book and have the answers like, Hey guys, here's how you do it. But you read about it time and time again, even Michael Phelps, like any Olympian or anyone that's tasted those successes on the sporting field. Um, that transition is not easy. And there is no playbook. There is no, Oh, this is how you do it. Oh, you just, you do this, get into real estate or you do this and you find another, or you get another degree or you do this. I was doing all of that stuff. I was trying to figure it out. And I was at the lowest moment of my life. Um, shortly after, and the reason we, we reconnected was we needed a really bomb spot for a photo shoot for an underwear photo shoot. Fuck yeah, that's right. Yeah. And I called you out of the blue and I'd been listening to your podcast. And honestly, it was helping so much. I remember your first ones, you were talking to like Regs and Laura and those guys about parenting and that transition and all the things that they were doing and motherhood. And I was like, God, this is, this is awesome. This is medicine. I really need to hear all this. And I think I'd sent you a couple of texts, like, thanks for doing it. Keep it up. I loved getting those. Really means a lot. Love you, man. Bye. Like maybe talk to you in six weeks. Um, but yeah, reconnected with you here with my kids on a like 35 degree day oh. doing an underwear shoot outside. So just picture that. That's fun. Um, and you just said like, hey, there's a group of guys that shows up on Wednesdays. And I, I just, that was water off a duck's back. I was like, okay, cool. Bye. No, it's not me anymore. I don't, I don't want to do that. My back hurts. And I, I don't, there was something about it. I don't know why I showed up. I don't know. I, still to this day, I don't know why I did. And I, I sat in and I did a workout and even my partner, the guy that I worked out with was, was Charles Clay. Yeah. And <laughs> Charles Clay ended up playing an unbelievably vital role in the story of my life. There was a reason I came that day and there was a reason that I was partnered with, with Chuck. Yeah. And there was a reason that, that all of that had happened. And only in retrospect, can we, can we put the pieces together? And I'm still not done writing that story, but. I, I just remember needing to talk to you and I didn't know why you and I had never shared any intimate moment or anything like that. But again, you're a public facing figure. Now I felt like I knew you better having listened to your podcast. And I just said like, I don't remember my exact words, but I just said like, I, I just wanted to thank you. And I wanted to let you know that you're a really good guy and that I needed this. And then I just started crying for yeah. no reason. And not like weep, but I was, didn't plan on crying, but I, I just started to cry. And that was just this outlet of emotion that I didn't know was pent up, but I'd been going through a lot of really low moments in myself, um, at, at my home, having anxiety attacks, um, for no good reason. And I was in this terrible spiral of like self-punishment and 
and and not physical self harm, but I the way I grew up was very, I was very much corrected, you know, perfection, and it wasn't like perfection was expected, but I didn't accept imperfection in myself, and that made it worse because I'm we live a great life, God, we live a blessed life. Like I've got three beautiful kids, my wife is the, just a, an unbelievable badass who who if I was in a video game as a 16 year old and was like messing around, creating a wife, she's it Mm. both, both on the mental, physical and spiritual levels. She's it. She makes me want to be better and she makes me better. And so I like all of these things were just like, I had such shame for feeling bad. I had such shame for not having an answer or knowing an answer. And And just being in this energy on that Wednesday, the very first time, it it was like this little crack in this dam and some water started to just kind of trickle out. And then the next week, more water started to trickle out. And then the next week, more water started to trickle out. And I got to meet all these amazing human beings and got to be a part of this energy that definitely wasn't the intention you were trying to cultivate. It was literally just like, guys, this, we're all getting tired of this. Let's get together. (laughs) You know? Yeah. Um, And I ended up talking more with Charles on the side, um, learning more about myself, getting to uh, develop a practice with Charles of meditation, inner work. I got to reparent my inner child. I got to create like an emotional intelligence journal and learn a bunch of skills that helped me dig out of this terribly, terribly exhaustive and dangerous hole I was in. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for sharing that. And and for people who don't know, Charles has been on the podcast as well. So definitely check out that to get a little more insight into the work that he does. Cause it is amazing. And he's such an incredible soul. He's really just, yeah, he's, he's, he's a plus, you know, when you said to me, you know, you're a really good guy and in other words, as a sentence, if you read it, it's not a big deal. The way you said it and you know, it wasn't the words either. It was just what, what it meant to you. And I think, you know, upon reflection, what, what I saw is, is part of the triggering of the emotion, because we talked about it a little bit after, is that you didn't feel like you were a good guy. And you felt like you had made certain sacrifices and acted in a way in your career that to your point earlier, you don't get to be number one in the world at anything without having a singular focus and basically trying to use everything you can as resources for yourself. And and maybe not use it all, but sacrifices were made unbeknownst to people around me, my wife included, where she didn't, she didn't ever get my full self because my full self was pointed in a direction just, just off center from her. Yeah. And that, that resonated with me. Um, because I've, I've experienced that before and what I was wanting to help you release was this idea that that's who you are. You know, um, a lot of this stuff, when, when we, you know, we look back and we act in a way that maybe we're not proud of is unconscious. And sure, it's consciously you're trying to be the best athlete in the world, but what's happening around you, it's like you don't have the, the mental bandwidth to, to uh, kind of sort that out. And so you do whatever you can to stay on task. And I just remember thinking like, A, you're going to be all right. Um, At least somebody knew that back then. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Because, you know, look, I mean, I, I think about when, when, when I had Lance on the podcast, Lance was similar in the. One in, of your best podcasts, by the way. Oh, really? Like, yeah. I mean, that was like, what, like 14 months ago or it was a long, was one of your like first. One of the first. But he talks, when he talks about fatherhood and all that stuff, it really, that was awesome. Thank really you. cool. You could tell, I mean, he opened up and shared stuff that you didn't talk about. Yeah, no, and I, I felt that. And you never know what, what anybody's going to share on the podcast, particularly someone as, as public as Lance. Mm-hmm. But um, I definitely got a lot of feedback. People were like, dude, I've never seen that side of him. And like, he's a really good friend. Well, but Lance's history, there's a, there's a, there's a lot of collateral damage. 
you know, so I say, fuck, if Lance can come back from this, whatever you did, and I know that you, even though you maybe acted in that way, you did it with integrity. So I'm like, he's just like, he just will need to get to a point where he accepts all of it for the reason you did it. And it wasn't ill intended. You weren't trying to hurt anybody. But again, you were doing whatever you could to perform at the highest level. And so I just, it's like, oh, this is like, I just knew you were, because you were asking the right questions too. You were, and you were seeing, what you were seeing in me was something that I knew was already in you. You just hadn't seen it yet. You hadn't really touched it. You hadn't really connected with it to the level, certainly where you are today. And it just took the work. So back when, you know, you said you showed up at the workout and previous to that, you hadn't wanted to do that. We didn't have any fucking tools, dude. Like, wh- where do you even go? Yeah. And that makes it more challenging because you're like, I don't want to feel this way. I don't have these, you know, panic attacks. I don't want to do all this. I don't want to hurt my wife. You know, I, emotionally I hurt. By yeah. The way. yeah. <laughs> Thanks I'm for not, clearing that yeah. up. But you didn't know how to not do it. And again, like, I know that I've been there. I wanted mm. to, I want to stop hurting her. And it's like, oh, you, your, your intentions are right where they need to be. It's just a matter of getting with the right people and resources. And you did that with Charles, Jeez. which again, cosmically, the two of you came together. Yeah. And he'd still, yeah, we played pickleball like a couple of weeks ago. He kicked my ass in pickleball a couple of weeks ago. No shit. That was my first time playing, but he's, yeah, okay. he's good. That's he's good. pretty good. That's a good ca- caveat there. Yeah. Yeah. Anybody looking for a challenge? Yeah. Clay, Ch- Charles Clay's your guy. <laughs> All um, right. So I want to talk a little, I'm going to give people maybe a little more context for h- how you end up becoming the, the top athlete in the world. Cause I know that it, it wasn't that you just, throughout your entire life, you were doing track and field and you were succeeding. There were some things that happened along the way where one door shuts and another door that you didn't even know was there opens. Yeah. And in in retrospect, all of it makes sense. You know, it's like, oh yeah, of course that's what you did. Oh yeah. Of course that's how you, you went from X to, to Y to Z. Um, But really in all honesty, it was just a series of existential and clear and present traumatic experiences that in those moments, thank God I had a safety net and thank God I had like a family and coaches and advisors around me to, to prop me up, to make sure that I, even if I didn't believe it myself, I, I could lean on somebody to tell me it's going to be okay. In the same way that day that I got to hug it out with you and cry on you and you got to tell me you're going to try, you're all right. It was, it was, it was, versions of that exact instance from the moment I was 16 till I was 19. And again, when I was 20 and again, when I was 24, all of those things moved into this, had that that thematic experience of trauma and faith and just not, not like putting your head down and grinding, but just wanting to live a life in and, and have no regrets on my deathbed and have no reason to look back on regret and regret. You know, some of the things that are born out of this are Wednesday, what I, you know, it's in my calendar as a develop business development meeting because I, I don't want my wife who's now going to hear exactly what it is. It's a bunch of guys. <laughs> busted. It's, it's a bunch of grown men. It's a boys club. It's like the He-Man Woman Haters Club. And we get around and we we smoke bags and we drink feel free and we talk about what's going on in our lives. And we talk about philosophical differences and existential things going on in society and the world. And then sometimes we move our bodies, but the physical development of that, it came out of this. The one thing that is ever present in my life that I didn't realize I was doing until Boyd said, dude, that's, that's a keynote was that unsexy discipline of just working and of doing the fundamentals of making sure that the bases are covered and that I am looking back on all my experiences with, with no regret. And so going back to high school, I, basketball was my first love. Basketball was the thing that I had probably the most natural, quick, gifted talent in. And, um, and then I was cut inexplicably from the, from the team. 
I was a starter. I was good. I was devastated. I, I didn't want to go to school. I was, I cried for a couple of days straight. What year was this? Uh, what I was year 16, high my junior year. And I, I was a starter. Like I played, I was a, like, I don't know how to describe it. This isn't like Michael Jordan getting cut. Like, and then like, oh, he's just going to work harder or whatever it was. I, I had no business not being on that team. I was a couple of years away from being the world's greatest athlete. I, it wasn't like I was this super crazy late bloomer. I mean, I wasn't that big, but um, it was devastating. But I had my mom. Could you, by the way, could you dunk? When I got cut, I could dunk. Okay. And I was the only guy that could. And then there was kind of a you know, little caveat in during halftime and after the game. So I would still go watch my friends. It took, a, it took me a little while to go watch games, but wow. I'd go watch all my, you. all my best friends. I would go watch, but then I would dunk after those games. And you know, the crowd's just like, why the fuck can that guy on the team? What does this guy, what does he do? You know? <laughs> um, Did he graduate? Yeah. So it, you know, wouldn't change a thing. First of all, second of all, had, there was no reason why that should have happened, could have happened. The coach has no explanation for it. Even to this day, nobody really knows. And, you know, there's no hard feelings. He, he something compelled him to do it. And it got me here. I'm sitting, I'm sitting in your, in your office talking about it, having a life I could have never dreamed about. So I'm not, I'm going to stop just short of thanking him, but I think that's fair. I, I had, cause there's a, there's a follow-up to this that I, I had this I, unbelievable backdrop of love and care and faith from my mom. And my mom knew there was a reason this was happening. She I, and, did. and I don't, and she, I remember distinctly, he's like, look, we don't know why this is happening, but there is a greater purpose to this. There's a reason that this is happening to you. And now as a parent, I'm like tearing up thinking about that experience from my own kid and having the fortitude and faith to, to just be there and to say that to my kid after their world is shattered and that, and there's bigger problems. I mean, if you want to talk textbook, you know, white people problems, this was it. Not in, not in your own world, we each. And, and, and I think I say this too, and I'm spreading this as far as I can get, but everybody's fart box is a different size. <laughs> so if we're in this huge room or if we're in like, if we're outside or if we're in a gymnasium and someone farts, it's not that big a deal. You're not going to catch the, the, the bulk of it. But if you're in a coffin, that's an, that's an horrible thing. Yeah. And so at the time I'm 16 years old, my box is pretty small. So the smallest little discomfort is life changing. Right. Yeah. But this was devastating. And I fell into this with my mom and had incredible support and then took the words of that coach and you know, it's not sustainable, but used it as motivation. He said, just go be a pole vaulter or something. That was his word. That, that was his last words of me getting out of the gym. Before we continue on, I do, I'm, I want to, I want to sit with this, um, this part with your mom. Because a, a lot of parents over time have said something similar and it goes in one ear and out the other because Oftentimes, it's not said the way your mom said it. Again, I want to go back to just the energy of it. You actually believed in what she said. She wasn't trying to make you just feel better. She truly had a belief that there's something greater. And I think, yes, like as your kids get older, they're going to have these different experiences that it's going to feel like the end of the world for them. I know I've experienced it with my kids and I, I think over the last couple of years, I've understood, I think what your mom understood back then is how to hold space for them to feel the pain and not try to make it go away, but to also give them hope that, you know, at the end of the day, and I think it's important for all of us to remember, we don't fucking know what any of this means when that door closes we have no idea what that next door opening is going to be. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you said it. I, and I remember your, I forget which podcast you were talking about, but maybe it was Stefan Ellis or, or something like that, but about learning how to hold space. And that's my mom did that. I mean, masterclass of not discrediting how I felt, giving that validity that, yeah, this was bad. Hey, this is really bad. 
and like, not fuck the coach and all that. Not like, at all. That's, it's easy to go down that road too. I don't oh, blame yeah. parents for doing that. Well, and don't get me wrong. They went and talked to the coach because they didn't believe me that I hadn't done something like horrendous. Like, what did he do to you to make? Because that's how crazy this was that I wasn't, that I had, wasn't going to play. I know there were some, the, the kids on the team were thinking about boycotting the season. The par- Yeah, the parents of the other kids on the team. I mean, I was, my friends were always going to play. There's no way. They're going to be like, sorry. I mean, sorry, Trey, but we love the, you know? Yeah. So the, it didn't make any sense. Just an inexplicable, like, why would this happen? You know? Um, and she validated my feelings. She held space for me as, as any parent would, you want to be that refuge that your child seeks. And I think that's a testament to who she was those first 16 years where if I'm feeling sad, I'm running to her arms. I'm not retreating into a corner. I'm, I'm, I'm living there. I'm, I'm her little boy. You, you, feel, know? you feel safe there. And I think that that, mm-hmm. that word validation, um, if there's anything I've learned in the last couple of years. It doesn't matter what my kid says. Maybe my daughter is saying some, one of her girlfriends is a this, that, and the other thing is it's don't take the side of, well, she's a nice, no validate what she's saying. Oh, like that sucks. Like I'm like, what's going on? And Mm -hmm. just, because when, once you start to, you know, play devil's advocate and try to be like, I want my daughter to be a good person. So she wants to look, that's not what's happening. And you continue to do that and your daughter's going to stop coming to you because you're full of shit. You're not validating what she's feeling. Doesn't mean you have to agree with the course of action she takes, Mm -hmm. but you have to validate because it's what she feels. It's her experience. And that's true. And geez, that's, that's why Chelsea, my wife is such a good mother is because that is her instinctual habit. Even with our five-year-old daughter, it's like, hey, she's feeling sad. Let's let's let her feel this this sadness and talk it talk it through, and not like, what's your problem? Like, what are you doing? Like, why are you acting this way? Look how good you have it. Look at all the things you get to do. It, you it, don't fucking care. No, she. It, it's okay to feel that feeling, and she just needs a hug. That kid just needs a hug. Who cares what just happened? That kid needs a hug. Look at that. And that's me. Yeah, I get I get brought back down out of the clouds all the time by my wife, and like, hey, hey, Trey, hey. Hey, she just needs a hug, you know? And so my mom did that just beautifully then. Gangster. So I went, I went out, let's, we can hop back on the track here. So I went back out Yes. and uh, about a year later, I set the, the indoor state pole vault record, which again, in Alabama, it's not that high. I mean, you're, you know, big fish, small pond and got noticed by some colleges. Um, up until that point was just high in the sky. I was going to get some academic scholarship somewhere. I was going to be an engineer or architectural design or do something, you know, I was pretty bad. I loved building with Legos. So that was it. And it was like architecture, building something like that. And, uh, sent some, some videos out, made some calls, cold call. I wasn't recruited, but just happened to get noticed that me setting the record was like, Hey, uh, Mississippi state just said like, Hey, we'd love for you to come check this out. You want to come on a visit? And I'm like, yes, I would. Um, that sparked some other schools to take a look and ended up going there, ended up going to Mississippi state showed up and they're like, Hey, you're going to train for the decathlon, you know? So I went from like this, the coolest, like one of these sports is not like the other in pole vault, like pole vault's just the coolest sport. I'm sorry. There's nothing, nothing it's touches it. Fucking rad. It's really, it's, it's super rad and the culture and the people involved. It's just unlike anything else into the decathlon, which is the hardest mentally, physically, emotionally draining thing on the planet. Um, reluctantly did it and hated it for five months, trained for it. Didn't know why I was training for it. Hated it. My body hurt. Everything hurt. I had no idea what I was doing it for. And then I did my first one in 2003 at the Texas relays and loved it. After the first event was like, Oh, this is cool. I get it now. I get how this works. Like the points and man, I get to compete 10 times. As you say, you get nine more of these. Wow. I get to do this all the time. And so went through that process and now had so much more intention with my, my work that I was doing. Yeah. You had your why with, and now it was like, all right, again, still externally motivated. Still like my why was just to go kick everyone's butt, you know, like I'm better than that guy, that, that ego. And that starts to grow as I got better. Um, and then my coach decides he's leaving and they cut the men's indoor program my sophomore year. So now 
I'm still in this, this mode. I'm still very fresh. I'm only a couple of years removed from being cut from the basketball team. And now I'm like, what is happening to me? You know, very much like, why, why can't I just have something nice? <laughs> <You> know, <God. laughs> like, please just let me do this. God, what the, what is going on? Right. And, and where were you like collegiately at this time? I was like, the second, ranked. second best kid in the nation. Oh, uh, second shit. best in NCAA. I got second place. I'd scored 8,000 points in an early decathlon. I'd won the, I was an SEC conference champion. Um, I, I was this up and still up and coming. Oh, he's still learning the event, but he's going to be pretty good. We don't know how good, but he's that 8,000 points is legit. Um, but still, uh, was at the Olympic trials in my fifth ever decathlon and was to my right was the world champion to my left was the future gold medalist in the Olympics. And I'm just in between them both going, I think I could do this, you know? Wow. So then now I'm stuck. Now I'm at a school where I don't have a coach anymore. They're not going to replace him with someone of equal or greater intelligence and value. Now, now I'm about to get you know, to be stuck in this like arrested development stage until I graduate and can find somewhere else to go. Or I can go look and see what else is out there. Just so happened that my coach who was leaving went to college and was teammates with the coach at Texas. And they had literally, you know, two weeks previous, just high-fived and just said, hey, do you know each other? Which they were probably setting it all up, but I just randomly met him. So I wrote him a letter and just said, hey, I, I don't know if you heard, but you know, my his name's Keith Powell. Keith's, Keith's moving on. Do you guys have space? I'm, I'm about to hit the market again. I want to, I want to transfer. And I took one visit. I was lined up there, full scholarship to Texas, full scholarship to Tennessee or full scholarship to Florida. Can't go wrong. I took, I only took one visit and it was, it was to Texas. And honestly, it was super smooth sailing until 2008. Um, you know, I won an NCAA championship my first year here. So what year is that? 2005. Okay. So 05, win a championship. And right before I transfer to Texas, I meet my now wife too. I meet her up at a track meet in Canada, sit down next to her. And I'm just like, Hey, your dad's Jan Johnson. Right. And so her dad was an Olympic bronze medalist and was kind of this, this figure, this, he's not a myth, but just like this figure in the sport where he had done such a beautiful job of growing the sport at, at a high school level and, and coached in college and had created these pole vault camps that were like just mythical. Like you would surf one day, pole vault the next, skateboard the next. And just, it was this lifestyle camp out in San Luis Obispo, California. And I'd never gotten a chance to go, but knew who he was. So that was my end, right? And hey, your dad's Jan Johnson, which now, and even shortly thereafter, I knew that was probably not the right move. Like, don't bring up her dad. <laughs> She's tired of hearing about her dad. And she was an awesome pole vaulter anyways. Um, we kept in contact. I moved to Texas and, you know, we're in Westlake right now. My wife's college roommate all four years is from Westlake, went to Westlake High. And so she would come back and hang out for weeks at a time with her. I mean, loved being in Austin. They were on, you know, they would go down to Lake Austin all the time. So when she was in town, I would just get to see her and get to hang out and we like keep that relationship going. And yeah, it, we, we had one year where we didn't speak. We had one year in oh, maybe late 07, all of 2008. And I didn't know why. And there was something inside me that could not put her to bed. Couldn't, couldn't quit. Couldn't, couldn't stop thinking about her. Couldn't not want to text. Couldn't not want to call. Couldn't, couldn't give it up. I was not, and I wasn't like addicted. It, we didn't really talk all the time, but there was just something about this woman I couldn't figure out. I was in a relationship. I was happily in a relationship as, as, as happy as you can be with a, <laughs> like a peak athlete, like we were talking about earlier, who's kind of an a-hole and very like point I'm pointed at this athletic success. You're on the side. Um, and 2008 goes by. I don't do well. And I'm, I'm at back the Olympics. at the Olympics. I make the Olympic team. I'm, I'm, I'm running for Nike. Like I'm, I, if you had told me I was going to run, you know, be able to even make a dollar doing the cathlon, I would have told you to screw off. There's no way. Um, and I am home and I'm sitting in my coach's office and he just looks at me and says, do you want to do this? 
And I was like, what? And he's like, what are you doing? I'm like, what do you mean? He's like, what are you doing? We just got back from China. What did we do there? Are you going to, is this something you really want to do? Cause it doesn't look like it to me. And it was that challenge of like, oh, whoa, whoa. Why am like, why am I here? What do I need to be doing? Like how to, what? And it just shocked, like complete wake up, shocked the system. He said, I don't want to see you for four weeks. And I came back four weeks later with this attitude and fire and intention and professionalized the shit out of, out of my life at that point. Mega turning point. I started writing everything down. I started being more involved in my own programming, taking control and ownership of all of my actions and decisions. And not a, a short time later, I called up Chelsea Johnson and was like, listen, I am not happy. And I'm never going to be happy until we do this. And to her credit, she goes, yep, me too. Like without missing a beat. And there's just something about, I, I'll, yeah, I'll never forget. It was July uh, 2nd. And she was dating somebody who just happened to be a competitor of mine. And I just said, look, if, if you end things with this, this guy, I'll, I'll end things with the, the girl I'm with. And you know, I'm never going to be happy until we give this a shot. She goes, yeah, me too. So that was on July 2nd. So July 3rd rolls around and she calls me up and she goes, well, I just ended it. And I'm like, oh, sh-. <laughs> like, wow, that was okay. Okay. I got to do this. All right. Done. <laughs> All right. Yes. So now we've, Chels. we've been, uh, yeah, we've been married for almost eight years. We've got three beautiful kids, but that was, that was the last thing that really was like the last thing for me of like, Need, I get not needing anything, but like full emancipation. I didn't, I didn't need anyone else. Chelsea was now my, my rock and Chelsea was now my, like my person I can lean into, um, in, in life and everything. And she understood what I was doing. She understood what it take, what it takes to be the best. Ah. She understood all of the, all of these things. And she was doing the same thing. She was world championship silver medalist. Like she was one of the best pole vaulters in the history of the United States collegiate record holder. Like she was way better athlete than I ever was. She gets college scholarships to play soccer. Happened to choose pole vault. Jeez. Yeah. Yeah. So it, that it, she became that, that refuge. And then that got really, really muddy sometimes when I want to be perfect for her. And I want to be perfect for my family and I want to be perfect. And I, we've had it out over the years as, as you do when you're raising a family, but like, She's like the only person in the world that can make me feel like I didn't live up to something like, like she's the only one in the world that has that, that like energy and that, that system and power. Um, How does that come out? Cause that's interesting because um, that could come across the wrong way when you hear like someone can make me feel like I didn't live up. There's plenty of parents out there that make their kids feel like that. Yeah. And it sounds like she has a different, much like your mom has an, has the ability to hold space for that, to, to, yeah, to love you, to show true love and also say, I know there's more in there. What does that look like? That's the word I think is love is that. And it's not an expectation, but she knows who I am. And when it's not expressed, she lets me know that it's, that's not, that's not you. It's kind of like, we were talking like, Hey, she just needs a hug. She needs her dad to hug her right now. Like that kind of thing. And, and it's, it goes back to kind of, maybe not the way, I don't want to say it's the way I was raised, but the, the, the same constructs that made me a very good professional athlete and really detailed oriented and focused on winning. And this is what it takes to be better. And this is how we win also make me hypercritical of myself and punish and want to punish myself in a way that's not healthy. I want to, want to that shame spiral, uh, and where I was a year ago, those same things. And now over the last course of the last 14 months, that's, that's been the work of, you know, reparenting my younger self, trying to re just figure out, okay, why, why does, why is this my visceral reaction to this? Why do I feel this way? It's okay to feel this way. It's all right. 
let's figure out why. And then let's, let's, let's have some tools. Let's, and that's what Charles helped with too. Let's, let's get some tools so that this doesn't have to happen again. And we can move through this and not pass this down to your kids. Cause that's the last thing I would want is for my kids to grow up and think like, man, my dad really messed me up, you know? Um, and just ending that generational trauma of, I don't want to say like hyper perfectionism, but like, man, and it, it's hard. It, it's hard to, to know that that's what made me great. And I don't want that for my kids. Yeah. It becomes back to, you know, having a, a, a being in right relation with that. And I think being able to turn that stuff on when the situation calls for it, when it's appropriate and not have that be your, your modus operandi Default mode. all the time. And I think that's, that's a lot of the work that a lot of us are stepping into that have had, you know, our different levels of success in different fields and have the positive reinforcement that look at what this gave me. And you know what I think? I feel like there's two type, two types of people. There are the one, if you don't mind, I'll use you as, as an example. You've, you've by and large done it. Like but I, I know in a lot of different categories, you've been really successful. And now you're on this journey to not undo any of that, but to unlearn a lot of that and to really find fulfillment and happiness now. There's people that have fulfillment and happiness that are now trying to find success and stability. And it's hard to, I think it's, it's hard to do it both ways, but you have to tap into some not great things to get this stability and, and some level of success. And not, I'm, not, I'm not talking about like chasing a number or like, oh, if I just get here, I'll be happy. But there's, two, there's those two types of people. There's people that just already get it right now and they're just not, you know, they're not there yet. Maybe they never get there. And then there's the people that got there and I put myself in that category. Like I was, I did it. I got to the, I got to the top of the mountain. Now I got to figure out how to be happy. You know? Yeah. That's, that's it. Because we're taught that you get to the top of the mountain, you're good. Like that's success. That's fulfillment. That's, that's what we're striving for. And then when you get on the top of that mountain, you're like, well, fuck, this isn't it. It's not even close to it because I feel fucking empty right now. The, the hitting that, like, it's like the moment you hit the peak, it's like this rush of endorphins and it's amazing and holy shit. And then soon after it's all gone and you're left with this, this like deep, it's almost, like, yeah, I want to just think be careful with my analogies here, but um, you, you need, it's not sustainable because you have to find another peak. And that's what a lot of people do. You know, I was on that train for a bit, but when you step off that and you stop climbing the mountain, you start to realize that, you know, it's almost like it, it's, it's like you go into the roots and the roots when if that's solid, then whatever, like whatever comes up through the soil and I'm trying to work this. I out love as, that. I love as, that analogy. I'm trying to work it out right now. So bear with me, but whatever comes through the soil and whatever fruit comes from that is, is comes from your heart, from your joy, from what, what, what is mm. truly fulfilling to you. And that's just the, the, the gravy on top. It's, you're not, you're not waiting. You're not saying when those, that fruit comes to bear, then I'm going to be happy. You're like, no, I love what I'm doing. I love what I'm creating. I love my life. And all this stuff is just, that's just cherry on top. This is such good therapy. Like, honestly, like this coming into this, that was, I was, I went on a walk around your neighborhood before doing, doing this. And I was like, let's uncover, I want to uncover some gems with, with Cal today. I want to have a good, deep conversation with my friend. And if I, I really like the soil, I really like that. And if you just enjoy gardening and enjoy tending to the soil, whatever comes out of it is just a blessing. It doesn't matter what it is. It's not going to be rotten because nope. you've, because you've, you're a good steward of, you're a good farmer. Because that, because that, again, that, that, that old paradigm is outcome-based. When the fruit comes up, then I'll be happy. Gar no, like people who are fucking 
into gardening and they're dope, they're present with the entire, you know, from fucking laying the soil to planting the seeds to watering and tending. They're not doing it for that one moment when they get to pick the cucumber off the vine. They're in it for the experience. It's about that journey. It's about being present with it. And then, you know, it's like, look, and I know we're going to get into this later on in the, in the conversation, but you and I have spent so much time together lately working on feel free. And, you know, for me, I've, I've, I've probably been investing in, in stuff like feel free for 25 years. And there's been nothing even close to the experience I've had with this in the sense that I love being a part of it. I love seeing what I can do to help it. And sure, I, I always try to help whatever investments I'm in. But for this, I'm, it ha, again, I keep using this word, but it's, it's important. It has such great energy around it and the people mm. involved. I don't care. At the end of the day, I don't really care about where this goes. Mm-hmm. It's going to do well. But I'm, I'm not in this for that payout outcome. And, and what this has done is this has informed me as I look at new deals, not to try to replicate this, but what is it about this that I love because I uncovered something here? Yeah, there's something about it. And now you know the, the ding, 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 ding when you see it next. Now you know, and you, and you know what? And I've talked about this before on the podcast, but I think it was, it was such a like aha moment for me that I had one day I was, I was kind of in the sauna and doing like a meditation and just kind of working out some things. And I had this, this knowing that when feel free sells and there's an exit, I'm going to be bummed. Mm. I'm going to be sad. There's going to be, a morning because what we get to experience right now and whatever's coming ahead for us, it'll be over. It'll be someone else's. It won't be like this. And it won't be No matter like how this. hard we try. But you know, we're so conditioned to get into this, invest in this for the outcome. And there's probably plenty of people in, who invested in it because they're like, yeah, this thing looks great and I, I'm looking for the outcome. And there's nothing wrong with that. That's a, yeah, I mean, that's a part of sustaining a business. You got to go sell it. You gotta, yes. You got to sell some outcome. No one, and, no one invests in kept feeling good. <laughs> but when it, when it, when it becomes all about that, and I've mm. been like that in plenty of private, it's like, I'm doing this because I think it'll be a five X, a 10 X, whatever. It's just, it's just not the same as just loving this and, and actually not trying to turn around and sell it because, you know, listen, we're not going to hold on too long either, but there's, there's something really important that, that for me, I understood about being involved with something like this. And it also starts to carry over in other areas of your life, whether it's your relationships. And it's like, I'm not, you know, this is what is so beautiful about our Wednesday group. We got a group of 13 guys and it is, it's, a, it's, it's, it's essentially a men's circle. I think we landed on that about a month ago. We're like, this isn't a workout group because we don't even work out every time, but it's three to four hours that we drop in and no one needs anything from anybody, period. So there's no outcome that anyone's trying to get by being there with the exception of deeper connection Mm -hmm. and, you know, sorting, like holding space for guys who are going through stuff or just playing around, talking crypto, talking feel free, whatever it is. We don't come in with an agenda. It's not formal. But guys show up. It's, it's, it's one of the most important times of their week. And it's, it's just a reminder, like when you start to, you know, when you come, when you step into an abundant mindset, stuff like outcome on a private equity investment doesn't matter. You're already good. You're good. You don't need that. And then once that hits and then I'll be able to, no. It's not to say you don't buy things when something like that hits, but you're not waiting for that. And with this group, we're just together. Whatever happens, it's just magic. Yeah, I, th- I think I call it on our text chain, it's alchemy. Like I th- we're coming in with, with 
everyone's bringing something different, but people are bringing something. No one, no one's coming with an empty basket ready to fill their baskets. People are bringing stuff into this, into this group. And God, there's so many different levels, like both, you know, meta of, of what you just described. I, I can't stop thinking about parenting as you're talking about it with, this is an outcome based. This is, this is love. Like this is love and you can invest love. And then that bears the, the juiciest, ripest fruit. Um, like, yeah, I think this is good. This is therapy well, here. And, like, and you know what? It can be outcome based if you just turn it on the side a little bit. For me, the outcome that I'm wanting is a deep trust with my kids. I want them to feel like they can, that I can hold anything. They can trust me with anything. And so I try to let them be who they are. And I, and I, and I let the world kind of sort out what lessons they need to learn on a larger level. Like I'm not trying to stop them from doing all the things to protect them. Yeah. I mean, listen, we have a lot of conversations about different things. So they understand how I feel, but when they fuck up, I just handle it differently than I used to. Mm. And now they know that they can fuck up and it's going to be okay. That they can trust me that I'm going to handle it, you know, with an open heart and, and fairly, but there will be, you know, there will be some accountability, but it's not so penal that they're mm -hmm. going to hide everything from me. And I, for sure, they're, they're not telling me everything. I wouldn't expect that. Yeah. They but that's, a, that's a scary thought to, to, to be in a house full of teenagers who, you know, don't trust you. That's, oh. a, that's a nightmare. But, Ooh. but so many people miss that. They think they're onto them and they, 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 they bust them doing something. Again, I've been there. You bust them and you fucking gotcha. It's like, yeah, you have no idea what is actually going on. And you're just alienating your kids right now. Mm. And so the outcome for me is how do we get that relationship where there's a mutual trust and respect and a love and, and, just, and just let them figure out who they are without me putting my shit on them and who I think they should be. Yeah. And that, that's the recurring nightmare of myself as I was doing that, that work of the last thing in the world I want is for my kids to turn out like me and not, not me like the, have any kind of success in their, their endeavors, but to, to carry the things that are, you know, like my, all my faults and, and shortcomings and, and, my, you know, all the stuff I'm not proud of, which to me is ever present and always like, okay, why am I doing this? Why am I doing this? Why am I doing this? It's where the work is for me in my life. And that's the, that's my only goal as a father is to just cut off all of this generational trauma and, and make sure that my kids just know that, that I'm doing my best and I want them to trust me, but there's love here in the same way that I can look back on my life and see all the people that held space for me during those times, there was, there was love and trust there. And that's all, I mean, that's all I can really hope for. Yes. And if they turn out like you sit with that for a second, I know there's shit in your life that you're like, quote unquote, not proud of. There's not a single human that doesn't have that. They just have, we all have our different versions. That all that stuff made you who you are to think about who you are today, man. Think about the work you're doing, have been doing. Think about like when you look in the mirror, you wouldn't wish that for your kids. You wish better for your kids. That's fair, you but, know? but they're going to have their shit too. And all that stuff, man, all that single mindedness and having to, you know, put off relationships. It's okay. Like it worked out pretty fucking good for you and it's only getting better. It's okay. If your kids, I mean, from, from where I sit, it's pretty fucking okay. They're going to have their stuff. We're all going to have our stuff. What you're doing, you and Chelsea, you're creating a safe space for them to be able to share that stuff. And so whatever their shit is, they know that there is love and a safe place for them to go. Fuck dude. They're going to be okay. You know? When you say it like that, yeah. It's, it's, it's 
simple on this side of complexity for for certain. And yeah, that's, there's a lot of work behind those, that sentence, you know? Well, and, and, and listen, and, and, and I only say this because I've had people reflect it to me, shared what you're, what you're sharing. And there, there comes a point when we fully accept everything that's happened up until this point in our life, all the things that we've quote unquote done. Mm -hmm. And we fully accept that we start to have, I started to have real gratitude for the things where I fucked up and didn't act in a way that I would today. Those things led me to the right way. I don't, know, I don't like to put a judgment on it, but for me, like I, I, it's part of my learning is to fuck it up. You know, Boyd talks about it. The, the path of not here is part of the path of here. Sometimes we've got to go down that path of not here to understand what the path of here is. And when we do that, just start to, there starts to be an acceptance. And that's what's really helped me, I think, with my kids. It's like they may be going down a path of not here, but they'll course correct. Maybe not as soon as I would like, because I want my kids to be happy too. But I know that that's not normal for kids to always be happy. If they're always happy, then there's no cycles of, yeah. they're, they're hiding some shit. I was, yeah, I was, yeah. Right? And so it, it, it becomes this thing where, you know, I think so many parents have great intentions. They want their kids to have an amazing life and they don't want them to hurt and they want to protect them and give them this great life. But in, 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 in putting up those guardrails, we really rob them of the opportunity to have their own experience. And, you know, I learned that just in when, when Jake, you know, a year and a half ago broke his jaw, it was just, it, it, it gave me the opportunity to show up for him in a different way, to allow him to feel all that he was feeling with that, not to tell him it was going to be better. That's bullshit. It's not right now. It's not, I'm talking about like, what about right now? Mm -hmm. And I started to see what happened when I just asked what he needed or I allowed him to actually articulate what he needed rather than me assume what he needed. I don't fucking know. Like, what does he actually need? And, as I just like the shit's like, you want to fix that. You want to fix your kid yeah. who's got a broken <laughs> jaw and his face is swollen. I couldn't fix that. And I didn't try to I just tried to be there for him and let him know that everything he's feeling, the anger, the rage, the sadness, just validate it. Mm -hmm. It's just like, yeah, I, I couldn't do any of that, you know, a year ago. No, it was very, and it, selfish is the wrong word, but it was very, how can I do X or how can I fix this? Or how can I stop this instead of just existing and being present in those moments and having this, this peace and calm of, 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 yeah, of a gardener tending the soil and knowing that there's, and, and celebrating the thing like, Hey, yeah, you messed that up, but you know what? Here's, here's, here's what came out of that. Here's what you learned out of that. Just as I sit here today would not change anything that's happened to me in the last four years because of the people it's brought into my life, the, the lessons that I've learned and me knowing myself even that much more through those, those dark times. And I've seen now I've, I mean, I've, I'm stood toe to toe with my shadow like several times and it, it's won a couple of times, but now I'm starting to win. And so I'm starting to be able to more better recognize that. And I, now I have the tools to be able to not course correct, but I don't even think about those old things. I don't even think about, uh, about my children the way I used to think about my children. It's been really, really cathartic. We, when our kids were born, we got them all email addresses. So they have all email addresses and my, my stepfather who we lost, who I had, I had a, an interesting relationship with, um, lost a, we lost him to leukemia back in 2013. And he, uh, they were cleaning out some of his stuff and we found these letters that he had written me and he just hadn't given them to me. And he wrote me about just random stuff. <laughs> like he talked to me about a Christmas one time. He talked to me about how his parents raised him and how embarrassing it all was. And there's some nuggets in there of lessons, but you know what it was? It was this man 
just trying to connect with his stepson on a level that I had no idea he would ever, he was ever trying to connect. And they are, it's three letters. That's it. And it's the most, they're framed in gold frames at my house and I've got copies of them everywhere, but we've got, I want my kids to have that. Like I want it so bad to have that. And so just even recently, I've wanted my kids to have this like beautiful, powerful email that they're going to get when they're 15 and read it and be like, man, my dad loved me so much. And less than a month ago, I was like, what? What it was doing was keeping me from writing emails. They had to be powerful and they had to have nuggets and they had to have lessons and they had to have all these things that I thought they needed to have instead of just having a conversation with my kids. Like you would email someone you hadn't talked to in a month. Like they do something really silly. They go to bed. We put them in bed. I'm in my, I'm in my, my office before I go to bed and I'm just like, man, Hey Penny, today you did this wiggle with your hips. You have, you are such a light and such a joy. And I express this gratitude to my kids. And the next day, that gratitude and that joy and that, that space that I, that I hold them in carries over. And so now I wake up and no matter what time in the morning they wake up or no matter how bad a mood they're in, I've already set this, this reticular activation in this moment of joy and holding her in this beautiful space because of her light and her energy, because I'm just writing these little things. And so that gift that my, my stepdad was able to give to me, um, just honestly, just kind of keeps giving. And highly recommend that for anybody with, with young kids, snag their name at Gmail or whatever you want to use and just start writing them letters. So they've got an inbox full from myself and my wife. And so I, I don't know when they're, whenever they need email addresses now, which I'm sure by the time you know, they'll be like seven years old and need an email address, I'm sure. But um, that's been a really fun practice for myself to, to switch, to switch over into this mode where. I don't have to be like any other dad. I don't have to make up for the shortcomings of my father. I don't have to make up for, you know, the way my mom raised two kids by herself. I don't have to do any of that. I can be this guy and I can be this guy for my kids. And it's been just, it's been fantastic. It's really been fantastic. And, and my relationship with my, my dad has been healed like over the last year. And it's just, stuff is moving in this direction. No joke. It's not corny, but just because I came to that workout on Wednesday. Mm. You never know, right? When you say yes to something, what, what comes out of that? I'd love to dig a little bit deeper into what, what was the, you know, what allowed for the, the healing with your dad. In, in doing all the work with, with Charles, I got into just... And not, not like buried or repressed, but I knew that I was harboring some feelings. Like I didn't understand my parents were divorced. Um, my, my dad remarried really quickly after he had been seeing somebody else and left, uh, my mom with two young kids. Um, and as I had two young children of my own, I wrote them and I, I've told my wife several times, it, was, it made me really uncomfortable to think that my father could leave us. Cause I can't imagine doing that to my, my children right now. I don't, I just couldn't understand it. And so there was a lot of resentment and anger that was, I thought was completely done and old and gone, but now it was coming back up because now I had this family and I was reliving this trauma of my dad leaving us and not really, man, he really didn't want to be with us. Cause I, I don't, I don't, I just don't get it. And then I started to go back and reparent my younger self and tell him that everything was okay everything's going to be okay. And I knew I wasn't going to be a dad right? that I was going to be proud of unless I could have a relationship with my father. Mm. And I thought about being in my father's position and what would I want out of my children? You know, and I think my sister has gone on this journey. I have an older sister and they have a great relationship, but I just, I just never did. She was older. She had, she got, like, she was daddy's little girl when he left. I was in diapers still. What's the age difference? Uh, my sister's 18 months older. So she was three. I was like year, year and a half. Yep. So she was into it. I mean, there was, there was more of a relationship there, but I, I invited him out to, to Austin and I told him while you're here, I want to talk to you. And he's like, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. No problem. And I'm like, no, 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 we're <laughs> going to really get into it, dad. 
and I want to know everything. And so I, it wasn't like an interrogation. I didn't hold his feet to the fire, but I said, look, dad, I love you. And I want to, I want to make this better. Like I, we don't have much time left on the planet. And if, if I'm going to be a good dad, I got to, we, you and I have to figure this out and not like figure it out, solve, fix or whatever. But I had, we drove him out, we were building a house and I was just showing him the house. Like, this is where I'm going to grow my family. This is where we're going to be. And I got to tell you, dad, I can't imagine leaving my family. Oh, wow. And I, yeah. I want to know from your side oh, yes. exactly what, what, what led up to it. How are you feeling? Talk me through it as much as you want to. If you don't want to talk about it, let's talk about something else. But I want to give you the opportunity because dad, I've said in the past that I've forgiven you, but honestly, I can say right now to your face, I haven't really deep down there, there wasn't this whole forgiveness for me because I've, I lived with my mom and my mom, I, I only got to see this relationship through her eyes mm -hmm. and good, bad, or indifferent dad, that didn't paint you in a great light. <laughs> Just so, FYI, if you were wondering, I mean, I think, and there's no, nothing wrong with that. There's no blame. And he was, he admittedly was like, yeah, I deserve that. Yeah, like I understand. And he got to talk me through all of the, the events that led into, to them separating. And, um, I do, I, I care deeply and really love his wife. He's still with, with Deborah. I've got a half brother named, named John and love them. I mean, they're family and there is no, there's no like they're over there. We're over here. There is no like teams on this. We're, we're hardies and we're there, but he got to, share stuff I had never heard. And I was like, Hey, I don't know if you ever wanted to do this, but I'm going to give you the opportunity right now. You say whatever you want. And let's, I just want to know. And we started walking and we went on, I think it was like a three and a half hour walk. I was like, man, you hungry? He's like, yeah, I'm hungry. All right, great. Let's get in the car. We kept talking, went and got P Terry's. We ate the P Terry's in the parking lot, in the car, kept talking, drove back. I think all in all, maybe it was seven, eight hours of just, and then what? Yeah. And then what? Oh yeah. That, no, I understand. No, that makes a lot of sense. And I think for him, it was more cathartic than it was for myself where he didn't know he needed to tell me all these things. And honestly, from that moment on, that was a, that was a pivotal moment. I'd been doing the work and trying to figure stuff out, but man, that unlocked a, it was like opening a door and it, it's like the door that you think goes to the basement and then the garden of Eden is behind it. Oh. And you step into that. And I'm like, the way I am with my family, the way I think about our future, the way that I know that there is, there's, there are things beyond the horizon that are beautiful that we'll, we'll get to when we get there and the fear and the, like the uncertainty and the unknowing of, of what parenthood really is is no longer scary. And then the relationship I have with my dad now is, is better than I, than, you know, I could have imagined. Like, it's just this beautiful, beautiful thing. Again, circling back, born out of showing up on a Wednesday, just, and just not knowing why, but just showing up, you know? I'm so glad I asked because, you know, my relationship with my dad is, you know, uh, it's not strained or anything like that, but there's just not a lot of substance to it, hmm. you know, you know, in reflecting on other relationships that I see and the ones I have with my kids. And, and I, I think, um, hearing, you know, you just give your dad this, like, I, I there's so much I don't know about my dad and I'll, what do, what do we do when we don't know? Generally, we just make assumptions. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I've, I've you know, I, I made, made peace with this idea of how hard he was when, you know, when I was younger. And, you know, when the rage would come out and how that scared me. But, but as I, I started to, like, look deeper, and again, I'm making assumptions here, but I started to see, well, actually... I think he was trying to make me the, the best young man he could. As best he knew how. With the tools he had. And I look back at who raised him. It's like, fuck, okay. 
that makes sense. And all he knew was discipline. And what happened? I mean, there was, sure, there's a wounded inner child in there, but that wanting to be loved and wanting to achieve to earn his love was, was a big factor in the life I've created, you know, on the, on the outside. Mm-hmm. And gosh, yeah, like I'm totally inspired to reach out to him and take that walk with him because like, why wouldn't I? There's a, like a healing that, that, you know, I've been wanting to reach with him, but I, I haven't figured out how to do it. I've been sitting with it and then I don't sit with it anymore. I was like, yeah, oh, maybe it's just, just going to be what it is now. And that's okay. And it's like, no, that's, that's a bit of a cop out. And for me, I tried to do it before. Like this is, I'm a, I'm a 38 year old father of three. I had plenty of time in my life to do this with my father. And this was the first time I, that it was love centered. This was the first time that it wasn't me trying to tell him something about how I felt. This was, this was myself giving him the opportunity to, to connect that I felt like we needed to, to connect. And it was like, we're talking about with our kids, this was a safe, safe space that was full of love. And we could have, we could have talked about baseball for all, for all intents and purposes, but we went on a eight, like eight hour walk, you know? And it was like, I think he saw my intention was that, look, I want to take the best parts of you and pass that on. And I want to take the parts of you that we both know aren't good. And it ends with me. I need your help. And it ain't going to happen unless we, unless we sit, sit with this together and talk, Mm. you know? And it was this, like, we're doing this together. This isn't, I don't want anything from you. I want to, let's, let's hold this. You know, it was about, it was about holding space. Yeah. Yeah. And it sounds like you just went in and you were obviously an open heart, but you're just curious and you weren't, you weren't trying to make sense of anything. You were letting him tell you his experience. Mm Mm-hmm. And I, all I did was sit there and opened up my chest and he could see everything that I was and how I was feeling. And it was the most, in, it was intimate. The most first, it was the first time we'd ever had that intimacy. Like, he's, he's my dad, you know, like it was very. I think you and I aren't the only ones out there who have these types of relationships. So I think this, this sharing this today, thank you, I think is going to, um, yeah, I think it's going to inspire a lot of people to just take that first step and listen. And I think the, 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 probably the most important part of that, because you said you've tried it before is you've done the work and you can come in with an open heart. You're not trying to be right. You're not trying to justify the way you felt before. You actually don't want to justify that. You don't want to feel that. So you came in after working on your own shit mm-hmm. and then came in there um, really just. And I, I owned my own shit and, and was prepared to be vulnerable with it too, you know, and prepared to be, Hey, this, I'm really, I struggle with this. And it was, it was kind of, I don't want to say nice, but when you can like not misery loves company, but like, Hey, I really struggle with the kids when X, Y, or Z happens. Do you, what's going on? he's like, I, I did that too. I did that too with you and your mom and your sister. Like I, I, and here's how, here's what my dad used to do to me. And so, you know, he was doing way better than his dad had done to him. Yeah. And he's like, man, you're doing way better than I did to you. He's like, okay. I'm like, okay, that's all I want. That, that's all, we, that's all we're all trying to do. And it, it just felt like we were in this. And I think walking's important too. This yeah. isn't a, this isn't a phone call. This is, this is real fellowship where for all of time, men were hunters. And I love the, the analogy, like golf is just something you do while you're connecting with your friends. Yes. You know? Oh yeah. We're shoulder to shoulder and we're walking and we're on a mission and it frees up. It's the same walking in nature. It just frees up that part of your mind that can go deeper and connect and that, 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 that mesh point between the, the conscious and subconscious where 
things come out that I didn't even plan on talking to him about. Things were coming out that way and same for him. And um, then it gave me a better insight. It, it doesn't have to be your mom or your dad or anybody, but it gives you better insight on the people around him and the people around. And I got to know my mom better. You know, I got to, I got to know my mom through talking to my dad. So it was, yeah, it, if <laughs> with the caveat that there's a lot of work that happens beforehand, this is it, one day they're going to be gone. One day it's, it's all gone and they're not never going to know unless you, you've reached out. Yeah. Beautiful. Thank you. And as we sip on our sun life and you're having a little feel free, thanks Khalil. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I'd love to, to shift gears. Um, yesterday you gave a keynote and the idea of your amazing keynote was birthed at Sun Life with, uh, with our friend Boyd Vardy. And I, I would love, honestly, this is like, this is for people listening out there who are, are um, in, the, in the business of hiring people to give really inspirational um, talks. I'd love to just give us like, give us like the, maybe the shorter version of your story because it is amazing <laughs> and there's so much in it. And I think it's important because I, because I want to talk about 2012, like why mm-hmm. it was different than 2008. You said you professionalized the sport. Mm-hmm. And then what did that look like? So you just went and you did great and all that led to a silver medal, right? Yeah. And then, you know, no bumps along the way. Yeah. It's super smooth. And really, I mean, when you look at a, you know, a career on, on paper, you see this like, okay, made the Olympics. Okay. Gold medal, gold medal, gold medal, U S champ, U S champ, U S champ, gold, gold, gold. Oh, silver. Oh man. What happened? Silver. That stinks. Sorry, man. That's the reaction I get from people is that, oh man, sorry. That, what happened? Like what happened? Like something went wrong. I'm like this no, no, is no. like just what you were talking about with your dad. You, they make an assumption. They yeah. actually don't. They're not curious, or maybe I think they end up getting curious. But you just make this assumption that that's a bad thing. Yeah, it that that year of my life defined me for the rest of my life. It was the most transformative and informative and powerful um, ten and a half months of of my life. I mean. It, it informs every decision I make. It informs every way I attack a goal. It informs every way I plan for the future. It, it, it does everything for me. So I was in the um, best shape of my life and was heading into Daegu, South Korea in 2011 for the world championships. And there was a, I had a terrible meet um, and I'm on the run, javelin runway and I'm throwing my heart out. And I have this little, this little like tingle in my elbow and I'm at the back of the runway for my third attempt in the javelin, which is the ninth event. I could, I didn't have to throw. I didn't have to do it. I could have just passed and run the 1500 and won the doggone meet and been a two-time world champion. The doggone meet. The That's dog, kind of funny. The doggone meet. And uh, I throw it. You had never done that though? Or was it, was it, or was it a real consideration? Did you think about it? It's like, you know what? It's just, just, there's just a, have you ever had something go wrong? Like a big injury? Oh, plenty. Yeah. I mean, I've, I've, you know, dislocated my feet. I, I, the only thing I'd never, Jesus. the only thing I've never had is like arthroscopic knee surgery, but I've strained every muscle. I've, I've torn everything. Like I've done it makes all. makes sense. You're doing 10. Bulged events. every disc. Like I've, I've done it all. Right. And, but until that point, my, you know, my, my elbows are money, like nothing, everything's fine. You know, I'm strong as an ox. Like I'm like, I, my metrics, like, I was a tank, man. So, and the, so the elbow wasn't like something you're like, basically nothing's ever happened with this. It'll probably just be a little, whatever. I'll be fine. And I'm throwing great. I, the, my first throw of the competition, I set a personal best first throw of that meet. So I'm like, here we go. And it wasn't a good technical throw. I was like, man, let's clean this up. It's going to go way. It's going to go really far. And it, there was some magic there. And so I'm at the back of the runway. I run down fast as I've ever run down the runway, put on the brakes, pow. Like, and it is, it's a cracking of a bull whip and there's lightning going through your body and all this energy is flowing through and the energy flows from my, my leg, through my hips, through my chest, what? out my shoulder and it gets to my elbow. And that's the last kind of, that's the last little hinge. You it's got to go through. All that. 
and it's a train wreck and my elbow is up next to my my ear and just the loudest crack like like just snap the javelin leaves and you hear me scream at the the keynote has this really cool media um working for nbc has its perks you know i get access to all this cool raw footage so and i'm just screaming and normally there's like a scream anyway like ah, like and you you wanted to go far it's pretty primal it's awesome and this was not that and i didn't realize it at the time this little side note you know my buddy ashton eaton multiple world record holder double olympic gold medalist I, he finished second in this meet it was the last technically i think it was the last guy to ever beat him which is like this i'm going to put that on my tombstone probably last guy to beat ashton eaton um he uh you can hear him because it's raw footage from a steady cam on the on the field and you can hear him going you all right trey trey hey man hey, hey you're all right you okay and that's kind of all you hear and all i'm doing is sitting there doing this and just hold my elbow i shredded it like completely you know everyone baseball pitchers get it like tommy john and usually they throw a ball and pitchers are never pitching 100%. You can't do that. That's unsustainable. Maybe the last pitch of a ninth inning, you're hitting him pretty hard. But like, you're, you've got a, a, ser- a rhythm that you can do. You're a distance runner in terms of like your explosiveness and an elbow. Okay. This was like, it, like a piece of dynamite went off in my elbow. I tore the pronator mass, a couple of flexor, like palmaris longus and brevis. I tore... Um, parts of my tricep and strained another part, but they couldn't even, the, my UCL, which is your ulnar collateral ligament was just floating in my elbow. Um, we plastered it up, taped it up, braced it up. And I ran with like basically a cast, like a robot in the 1500 and I, and I, you know, win a world championship. Um, no just, shit. Yeah. So just, um, Kind of sounds cool when you say it like that though. Like fuck dude, I actually cool. didn't know that part. I didn't know that yeah. you finished. Yeah. And like didn't want painkillers because we I was gonna get I was gonna win. I was gonna get drug tested. And so didn't want any painkillers and like it some that was some serious pain. And you did. I was gonna say, was the adrenaline taken over or no? It was still very you crash. Painful. You know, like there's a there's a, you know, right before the race, you're just like, I don't I don't know if I could do it, but it ended up being a pretty good distraction all the other pain oh, that's going on. Yeah. So I was able to focus a little bit. I didn't run particularly fast, but I ran enough. I won and I get home. I go down to Bernie to the San Antonio Spurs facility where we had a, a doc friend and we got an MRI and they're about to read me the results. And I, next thing I know, I wake up and I'm, I'm like on the ground. They're like, Whoa, you all right? And I'm like, what, what, what happened? And they're like, well, we told you that you were going to have to have surgery and you passed out. I'm like, oh, no. no okay, shit. great. So I'm driving home. I call my mom, uh, who is a controller at a hospital right above Champion Sports Medicine Clinic, which is where Dr. James Andrews operates. He's the godfather of orthopedic surgery. He had, he's the guy that put Drew Brees' arm back together and got him that killer deal coming out of San Diego to New Orleans. So all of that stuff just unbelievably positioned on a Monday to call my mom. And then I was under the knife on Thursday morning because Dr. Andrews did the surgery personally because like to his credit, he just goes, Oh man, the Olympics are in 10 months. We got to get them ready. You know, like just good old boy got in there and fixed it. And I'm going to speed this story up because it's getting pretty long, but it's okay. So I, cause again, I I do, I want this to be a morsel for people. I want, I want the, definitely want the, the key points. But I want people to be, you know, listening at the end on how to get in touch with you. Okay. Because it's epic. There we go. So the, uh, I'm the world's greatest athlete and I'm, I've got eight months to the Olympic trials, eight months to the Olympics. And these were going to be my Olympics. I was the reigning, I was going to be the Olympic champion. I'd signed a deal. I was, if I won gold, I was going to be on the cover of the Wheaties box. Like all that stuff was laid out for me. I was the guy. And I wake up out of surgery and I can't even move my fingers and I'm just bawling. I'm like, this is it. I'm done. There's no way. There's no way. Two days later, I could barely move my fingers. They tra- had to transpose my nerve because it was so jacked up down there. They took my ulnar nerve, they put it on top. and I, I, There was no light at the end of this tunnel. Like no way. It takes, it takes major league baseball guys a, two years to get back say, to like they, pitch they, count. They're off 
yeah, at least one season of just anything. Yeah. So, wow. Less, uh, less than a week after surgery, I sat, I sat with myself um, and thought about who I was as a man, thought about who I was, you know, who is, who is Trey Hardy and what kind of person do I want to be a year from now? What kind of person do I want to be five years from now? What kind of person do I want to look back on? Is this a story I want to tell my kids? Is this a story that I'm going to regret on my deathbed? And I knew that the only thing I could control was my attitude and my effort. And that I made a commitment at that moment that I was going to, there was not going to be anything I wasn't going to do in order to give myself a shot. It's the only way that this is a failure is if I have any regret. And things worked out. There's an insane number of, of repetitions that I did. Um, and I like, like Boyd said, what like, kind of exercises? The least <laughs> sexy one. I mean, it's it started with this, just touching my fingers together, re, re, reconnecting all these nerve endings that had no connection anymore because they pulled them. They pulled them out. And you want to talk about pain? That is some fire that you cannot put. You cannot put that fire out with painkillers. It is insane. Like we were calling the ER, you know, a week after surgery, saying something is wrong. They're like, no, this is normal. Like, you're going to be okay. I'm like, this is not okay. But I was not going to look back on that time wishing I had done more. And I did 375,000 repetitions just on this right arm alone. And I wrote them all down. I've got, I've got every record of every rep I ever did. Oh wrote them all gosh. down. I uh, wrote them with my left hand the first month and then switched back over. And, you know, you go from doing that. I, I couldn't straighten my arm for five weeks, maybe like six weeks until I could actually like straighten my arm. And then you wake up the next day and I can only get it to here. It took uh, four months to do a push up, And I threw the javelin one time. I was going to say, how many times did you actually throw the javelin? I threw it one time before the Olympic trials. No to see, shit. like, Because up until that point, I'm like, we're going to have to throw left-handed. This is not it. And what was your left throw oh, like, relative? Oh, like 20 meters. The javelin is an, an it's a, it's so tactile. Like it's so, um, there's a lot of touch. Okay. It, it's not like throwing a football. Like, yeah, anyone could probably learn to do a spiral on a football. This is like a football and a dart and a paper airplane and writing your name in cursive on a grain of rice. Like there's a lot of like really intricate stuff that you've got to hit it really perfectly. And the touch there Left-handed went about 20 meters. The week before the Olympic trials, it went 21 meters with my right arm and it hurt like a, like, oh no. <laughs> like I just took a couple of steps backwards here. What are we going to do? It hurts. It hurt oh, pretty bad. Fuck. So I, I went into the Olympic trials thinking, what do I have to lose? I've, I've done everything under my, in my power to be ready and to perform. I have no regrets. Let's see what happens. And you would have thought I'd, you know, broken the world record. I threw just over 50 meters. And so what's your personal best? 69 meters. Okay. So. And what does 50 meters get you for points? Oh, like 500 points. And maybe. then what's the, what's the top you can get there? I've got, I'm in like the 800s. Okay. So 500. So it's 300. 350. Yep. And I'll just say like at any Olympics, the difference between gold and probably fifth or sixth place and maybe seventh or eighth is 350. Oh, wow. So this it's, you got to hit like, these are the best athletes in the world. You gotta, you gotta be on, you can't have an off day. So I get incredibly fortunate that we are in a time frame in the United States where there just isn't a third and fourth guy that's just ready to rock and roll and bang. So I ah. scrape through, I barely get the Olympic standard at the Olympic trials with that 50 meter throw and, and head into London with house money. What's the time frame between trials and Olympics? Four weeks. So it's that soon. Eight and a half months after surgery, I was at the Olympic trials and London was 10 months later, 10 months after surgery. Oh God. So now I'm in London with house money. Shouldn't be there. Can't believe I'm there. And I've got this outlook that not laissez faire, not who cares, but wow, what a joy. What an absolute blessing to be here. I, I can't, you know what? A part of me wants to like 
No, because they, they need to hear this story. I was like, maybe we don't go. Uh, they need to hear. <laughs> it's uh, I was, I'm gonna, I'll leave them on a cliff, but. Nah, you, you, this is powerful. Because every time I hear it, I'm like, this is so fucking epic. There's so much in it. And I, I, I spend that summer knowing full well what a, what, how, like it's starting to make itself. It's starting to like uncover itself that, wow. And I, I was, I was very vocal about what I was doing in, in that, that off season and the process and what, what was going to happen. And you have to understand as a track and field athlete, all that goes into those Olympic years, there's plenty of money to be made everywhere else in, in off years and world championships are, are worth a lot of money. And it's, it was me providing for my family and saving for the future and all this stuff. But then in an Olympic year, you get all these people coming out of the woodwork and you know, there's McDonald's and Budweiser, at and all these, all these enormous billion dollar entities are betting on you. And my agent did a fantastic job of like BSing his way through the fall saying, yeah, trade's going to be fine. You know, but the closer we got to it in like March, April, May, we're doing the media for it. Now we're physically there and their head, like people's jobs are on the line because they picked Trey Hardy to be the guy that's going to be on TV the most, the guy that's going to be doing well and bringing home medals for the United States. And so I began to believe it. I began to, to, to think, no, there is no one that has worked harder than me this year. There's no one that, that, that has put themselves in this position. My shoulder was a laser rocket shoulder because of all the elbow work oh, I had done. Shit. My shoulder is indestructible. If we can just, it just needed a little bit more time to cook. And if I could throw 50 here, maybe I could throw like 55 or 56 meters, pick up another hundred points and everything else is going to get good too. Like we could, we could really do something in London. And you know what? I messed up so much in Beijing with that. I had the wrong attitude. I was just not enjoying it. I was pretty hyper-focused and neurotic. What happens if I just have a good time and like enjoy that process and be that and just be happy that I'm there. So. And not content. I think that's the important part. Not content that I'm there, but happy. Like enjoy, like you said, enjoy the process, enjoy the journey. Fucking it's what we're all searching for. Can I just be present for this experience? Like looking around at the like hundred meter start line and just going like, can you guys believe it? Can you believe we're here? Which gets in everyone else's head. So oh, so you literally like, said that. They're like, oh, Trey's messing with me. Like, what's going on? <laughs> so I, I'm there with this like joyful, you know, attitude. Shouldn't be there. House money, man. I have a, I'm having a great meet. Day one, I think I'm like third place, which is good for me. Um, you know, the hundred long jump, shot put, high jump, four hundred. Those are the first day events. You come back the next day, and I run an all time personal best in the hurdles. I beat Ashton, who's the best hurdler in the history of decathlon hurdles. I beat him, and then it's it is game on. It is like here we go. So. I am a couple of points out of first place after the discus going into pole vault. And it's like, all right, three more events. One of them's the jab. No one thinks I can throw the jab very far. I, I haven't thrown again since Olympic trials. I, I got to pole vault well. I've got to do this really, really well. And do- I'm guessing just your experience with the pole vault that you were always really strong in that against the field. Yeah. It's ace in the hole. Like it was, it was always there for me. I was, I'm a good pole vaulter and any issues with the elbow with that? No, because it's very, it's a straight arm. There's not a lot of, not a lot of pulling, like there's momentum. So it's not static. Um, it, it, you know, it wasn't easy and it came around much later in the season, but Cal, I had a terrible pole vault. I I had a terrible event. It wasn't good. I cleared my opening bar and then couldn't get past the next one. So I only got, I got a, you know, I was 120 points short of what I thought I was going to get out of that event. Oh, fuck. So now I go from like, I might beat Ashton. I might win this. I just, like, I went from that mentality when the pole vault was going to, I might, I'm going to finish fourth. Like, I'm not. This is it. It just slipped away and I'm on the jab runway and I'm, and that's, that's, that's the taste I have in my mouth. And I turn and I look at my coach and he's like, you ready? Cause again, I'm not really throwing that much jab and warming up. It's, it's okay. I only got a a throw in here. Like, I don't want to mess with this. I just saw the physiotherapist. We've got it taped up like nobody's business. Like there's not a lot of motion that can happen. 
which inhibits your ability to you inhibit your range of motion. So you can't throw as far, uh, but I knew I pro I, it was going to hurt less. I turn and I look at my coach and he's like, you ready? I was like, I'm going to try to, I, I don't remember exactly how I said it, but I remember the, along the lines of, I'm going to try to tear it again. And he's like, what? And I was like, I'm going to throw as hard as I've ever thrown. Oh, and he's wow. like, whoa, whoa, whoa. And he's like, I said, what more could I have done? I'm ready. And so I stepped to the back of the runway. My first throw was 63 meters. Oh my God. And so now, now, ooh. Now How were you generally against the field in the, the jav? Top, top three, top yep. four. But now, okay, now I'm going to run for bronze. Now we're, now we're in this spot I can run for bronze. Because the guy that was in bronze throws the jav 78 meters. Like he's a monster. Get the fuck He wins. Out. He throws, yeah, farther than Big Tom. Like, yeah, like way far. Crazy Cuban guy with a laser rocket. Just, he can just do it. So he is screaming down my back. Like he is there and he throws and I'm like, oh my God, I knew it. Like I knew he was going to do that. All right. And my coach is like, Trey, we did it. Great. Take your stuff off. Let's go get a little bit of food before the 1500. So you got some blood sugar and, and, and get your feet up and start getting ready, mentally prepared to run your, for your life. And I'm like, nah, I got one more. And he's like, no, no, no. Hey, we're good. Now you're good. You, we did it. Hey, you, we did it. We, we're going to get a medal. We did it. And I was like, nah, let's do another one. I got this. Let's do another one. Again, what more could I have done? And I'm at the back of the runway and they're about to start the medal ceremony for like the women's 10K and they're playing the Kenyan national anthem. And a woman comes to me and I've got my adrenaline going. I've already made this commitment that like, imagine you're about to jump off, you know, a 30 meter high dive into the water and you've made this physical and mental commitment to yourself. Oh. The switch is turned on yeah. and yeah. you're ready. And then someone goes, Hey, wait one second. Let's play this song first. Oh and shit. I'm like, you know what? No, it's been a long enough year. Please move, ma'am. I'm going to go. And they're like, well, they're doing the thing. I don't care. I'm going to go right now. Please, ma'am. I need <laughs> you to move. And she looked in my eyes and she's, she, she got it. She goes, went, started the clock. I turned and I looked at the crowd that was back there, asked them to start clapping and started things in motion that cannot be undone. And I went back there. I threw almost 67 meters on my next throw which oh is, God. which is a hundred and something more points than what I had just had. And you would have thought I, I hit the triple, you know, mega jackpot million. Like you would have thought I just won a billion dollars. Like you would have, I, I don't remember celebrating. I don't remember any of it, but I blacked out. I ran halfway around the track. I threw stuff into the stands and then I ran up into the stands and started hugging people. I hugged a big Tom who yeah. was there. Yeah. I hugged Tom. I hugged my coach. I'm like, I don't know what's happening. Meanwhile, the poor gal is just getting her medal and like it, all this is going on. And it was just this, like, I, I, it's, it's hard to kind of put your finger on. And only now that I've distanced myself from it so much that, that, that one moment, like what more could I have done that whole entire year of, of discipline and doing this unsexy stuff of touching my fingers together and just going through these motions and holding a weight so that I can straighten my arm and doing it while I was sleeping and doing all the things that I had done and having no regret of just mastering the hell out of these unsexy fundamentals had given me the platform to stand at the back of that runway and given me that ability to say, I got this. I got it. And I went from being told I couldn't hunt being that, that puma that couldn't hunt anymore and not being able to touch my fingers together to standing on a podium with a silver medal around my neck, 10, a little over 10 months later to find the rest of my career, not because of the medal, not because of that, but because of that journey and that lesson of that works, that works on any level that works on parenting, that works in, in fatherhood, that works on your relationship with your significant other, that works on mowing the lawn, that works. That works. And you want to talk about an application of like, that's a four year sales cycle, brother. That's oh, a. Oh, yeah, the Olympics. Hey, next one ain't coming around for another four years. What are you going to do now? And so 
the mental model and the ability to compartmentalize all that stuff along the way and program small wins and program through all this stuff so that I could peak at that, at that moment. I mean, that it, it's taken me four or five years to figure out how, how that applies everywhere else, but it's pretty universal. I need, I don't even have to try to apply it to anything. Everybody pulls from it. Everybody can relate to this part. Yeah. They pull, they pull what they need. And you know, what comes up for me is you did all that work. You did all that deep practice, the unsexy shit. So that when it came time to play, you actually did just that. You played, you had fun, but you had, it wasn't false confidence. It was what you could honestly answer. There's not one more thing I could have done. And so you can go out there and really, because we've all been unprepared for things and we can try to tell ourselves like we got this, but there, we know, mm-hmm. we know at a fucking soul level or something that we didn't do everything we could have. And some people haven't. And I've, I've been in situations where I hadn't before then. I didn't know what it looked like until that year. I was a two-time world champion and had no idea what real commitment and real work. And honestly, you know what's attached to that is vulnerability. You know what happens when you try really, really, really hard for something and people know you're trying hard? You're setting yourself up to, you're exposed. You're out there for the world to see. And then I was out there in spandex and had been very open about what I was doing. You know, and that, it, that exposure is terrifying, but the alternative is living a life of regret. The alternative is not never, never knowing where you can get to, where your potential is, where that, where that, you know, no one can even see their ceiling unless you can get there, unless you can really put yourself out there and, and, and pull on accountability. And I, that's even the, the, the speech I gave yesterday was born out of that. I think Boyd said it, I don't know if he stole the phrase, but he's like, yeah, first book the theater, then you build, then you write the play. And there's accountability there where tell, tell people what you're doing. Tell them, tell people your aspirations and your goals, get out there to help yourself through this motivation. Cause no one can do it alone, you know, but it's terrifying and it's okay that it's terrifying. It's really scary, you know, but I, I needed that, that like exposure you need that like little carrot on the end of the stick like and that's what track and field is too that's what the beauty of that sport for me is is we're we're gonna get to see the work you did like we're gonna get to see how much you've been practicing and training and how like we're gonna see who sacrificed the most really because at that level everybody's pretty damn talented everyone's got it we're just gonna see who who wanted it more yeah and it's different than like a team sport or some sport that's not you know even like uh the sports where there were the judges with the gymnastics or what it like, this is like the, the numbers don't lie. It's, it's out there. It is what it is. It's repeatable. You know, ones and zeros, binary objective, whatever you want to call it. There's nowhere to hide. It's, (laughs) it's all out there. And it, it's what I fell in love with and started to fall in love with even more again, after what happened in in high school, where there's, there might not call it politics or call it subjectivity of like referees and, people taking things away where like not necessarily does it happen in team sports where the best team wins, you know, that's right. Most times they do, but sometimes, you know, like the, the saints in the playoffs and the, the pass interference call, like it, it, that bothered me, bothered me a lot, but the exposure there and, and that I I'm so fulfilled and, and so full from that experience, because I can look back and proudly tell that story of getting second place, you know? It's so good. So rich, you know, here, here you are. So, so you're giving keynotes, you're, you're available to that. And I, I know you're also sling and feel free. Yeah. So you're, so you're, you're, you're coming on board officially, uh, still working on exactly. This is, yeah. This is the first announcement. Yeah. Think, yeah, yeah. It's official. It's official gang. But I, I would love to just drop in with that for a little bit and just share your experience with a being involved with feel free and w- what that has looked like for you. Cause you know, we both are, are super excited about it, but, but my path with it is different than yours. And so I'm curious to hear um, in your experiences with investing in different things, 
what is it about this that's really stood out? Because I know it has. Man, uh, the, the bumper sticker story for this, I was, I came over for the workouts. You would just become an investor and you just, you gave the, not, a, not even a pitch, but like, hey guys, try this. Let me know what you think. I, I dig it. I'm not going to tell you anything about it. Try it. I took one, didn't try it, brought it home with me, um, and then took my children to Zilker Park to play soccer. I took the whole bottle on the way down and I told my wife, I was like, look, I'm going to be like open book here. I'm going to tell you what I'm feeling. Just let me know if I'm getting off the rails. I'd yeah, never... we're getting it from Cal. It could have something in it. I was like this. <laughs> I feel like, I don't know if it's got any ketamine in it, but, <laughs> and she's like, what is that? I'm like, don't worry about it. It's fine. It, fast forward. It was the best hour and a half of my life with my children. And it is what, you know, I've never been deep in any medicine ceremonies or done any like super, super up there um, psychedelics. And so for me, that's what that experience was, was this opening up of this is what this could feel like. Like I've got this within me. And so the next time we went out, I mean, I don't, didn't have any feel free, but it was the same experience. And it was this opening up of my heart and detachment from the rest of my life and detachment from work detachment from, uh, I, you know, I didn't carry anything into that experience and that relationship and whatever was happening at the moment and it got into it. Like would buy it whenever I saw it at a seven 11, talk to you a little bit more about it, learned a little bit more about what was inside of it, how those work, how they work together. And then eventually it was like, Hey, can I, can I get JW's number from you? And you're like, Oh yeah, absolutely. Just give him a call. I'm like, are you sure? And he's like, Oh, he'd love to hear from you. Shared this experience with JW and told him just thank you. And he's just like, well, how can I help? And I was like, I, I mean, I don't, I mean, I don't know, but I'll just thank you and I'll keep you in the loop. And if I can help, you just let me know. So then JW reached out to me a couple of months later and said, Hey, there's this thing. It's, can you take a look at this contract? Um, and I helped him out with a little bit of like sports marketing stuff. And let's see, like four months later, we are, feel free is now the official tonic of USC athletics University of Texas athletics. And now as of two days ago, Florida state athletics, the Seminoles. And so I'm now managing those, those brand partnerships and activating and getting things in those, those markets, like super jazzed up and excited. And, and yeah, like you said, kind of slinging it. And that is now parlayed into JW just offered me a position in the company. And a year ago, I'm, I'm talking myself out of coming here to work out with you. And, Whoa. and I'm in a position right now where there is something unbelievably powerful that I'm passionate about that I think will change the world that I've told everyone in my life about that I can't say enough good things about that I've pulled in. And my friends have a lot of capital at risk in this company now because of me, you know, vow, not vouching, but like bringing it to them and showing them how passionate I am and saying I'm involved, not just, you know, financially, but I've, I'm invested physically into what's going on here. It, and for the very first time since I've retired, you know, I went back, I got my MBA as, you know, valedictorian. I've got all the skill sets. I, I went to school to be an entrepreneur. I get it. I know this is the, this is it. Like, this is the first alignment where, um, I, I can do all of the things and put my time and energy and effort. And it, it, it's hard to describe right now, but that, that whole body. Yes. That whole funk. Yes. When JW was talking to me and he's like, I'd like, I'd like for you to do this. And I want to offer you this position. I haven't felt that whole body funk. Yes. In a, in a very long time. And I'm just trying to keep it in the cage is what I would call it. Trying to keep my excitement at a, at a level that is <laughs> acceptable without being too, too modest. But I'm, I'm so proud of myself for the, for this last year and to end up where this is. And like we were talking about earlier, if it does well, it does well. If it doesn't, it, it doesn't, but I, I, I'm going to love this and I'm going to love and enjoy this part of the experience and bring everything that I just talked about in a keynote into the organization and into everybody that I work with and interact with so that we look back on it and know there's nothing else we could have done. Mm. Yeah, dude. Like I, I, Lot, lot to unpack there, but I will say, um, 
just in watching you like evaluate, analyze, put stuff together in spreadsheets. It's super impressive. Like that, that was like, I didn't expect that, you know, cause I didn't know that side of you. And the first time I used Excel was at in 2017 in, in business school. Well, dude, sorry, 2018. Yeah. <laughs> you, you figured it out. And I, I was so stoked when you had started to hint at like, I'm, I'm kind of at this crossroads where I'm, I'm happy to help out with feel free, but I feel like there's a bigger opportunity and I want it. I want to do that. It's like, that's amazing. And then JW was, you know, so I was kind of, I don't want to say in the middle, cause I was talking to both of you. Oh, no, and you it, were, yeah. yeah. You know, and, um, that's, that's what we need. You know, we, we need for this to continue to do what it's doing is we need people like you in there, like doing, the, doing some real work. But that's an interesting thing too. And I've, I've talked to people about you, you know, like behind your back, but like, I've said it in front of you, you're this, you're, you're an attractor. You are a light, a lighthouse. You're being you, you're doing your work and you're working really hard. And some stuff's in private, some stuff most is in public, which is an, an incredible ability that you have. Um, but you're a lighthouse and you, you attract boats to your Harbor and it's all kind of the same kind of boat. And that, mm. that boat is, is I would like to think of myself as that kind of boat. Mm. Um, there's no boats in the, in your Harbor that aren't anything, not that I, that's, that's a terrible sentence, but I know what you're saying. And that's what this, this company has been for me as well. And I, I don't, you know, I don't tell, I don't ask all my friends if they want to participate, but I, I do with the ones that align with what's going on. And it's been remarkable to see who's jumped on board and what we, what kind of a team we have now. And it's the same with JW. It's the same with the leader of the organization that the, the, the lighthouse that he is and the lighthouse that you are it's, and you know better than I do, but it just doesn't happen often. It doesn't. It doesn't. Right. And I, I truly believe that the, what this is able to do, how it was able to help me just as, as a father and to kind of open this up is, um, is, is life changing and that it can change the world. Like it really, really can. I mean, addiction is, is rampant across all walks of life here, whether it's alcohol or Adderall or substance abuse or opioids, whatever it is. And I, 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 I mean, I'm trying to figure out what, like, where's the catch? And yeah, <laughs> it's taken me a year and it's JW has been in it for three years and I, I don't, I, I can't figure it out. And there's, I just, it's snake oil. And you, you saw, we suffer, we suffer from this blessing that it does so many things so well and it's so task specific and it helps so many people so many different ways that it's, it's snake oil that it's, it's, it's off putting how good, how good this is. Exactly. Right. Yeah. When you, you, the three of us went and spoke to the, the class at UT, the marketing class. And I'm like, you know, it's hard to explain to people what it does. And when you start to try to list everything, people think I'm full of shit. And one of the girls raised her hand at the end of the class. She's like, I drank some of it and I didn't really feel much. So I f thought you were full of shit. And then I drank some more and then it actually did all the things you said it does because it does, it gives you energy focus, but also lowers your anxiety. And so like, look, you mentioned Adderall. There's way too many kids and adults on Adderall. And this is something that has a similar effect and is fucking safe. Mm -hmm. Um, it's a great alcohol replacement. So people who are trying to drink less or not drink at all, this comes in as the, you know, the substitute where you get to come in to an experience and feel the openness that you feel with alcohol with, without it going off the rails. Mm -hmm. And, and that's, that's the beauty of this, this, you know, tonic is that you have all the benefits and arguably I feel better on this than I do when I have a good alcohol buzz. And we all know the alcohol buzz is it's, it's, it's fucking, it's hard to hit that spot. And it's poison. Like, it's poison. And I, I, I drank my share of, of beverages in my life, but I, I think in the last calendar 12 months, I've had maybe 20 beers and like a couple of mixed drinks and a few glasses of wine in 12 months because I don't want it because it doesn't compare to this. 
And it just, yeah, it, it never, yeah, I, I don't, I, I can't believe people still choose to do it, honestly. Like, yeah, when you have this alternative. Right. But it, it, it's, you know, you mentioned parenting. And I think one of the things, like if you just use that as a, as a frame of reference, what did it do? It, 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 it opens your heart to your present. But you, you talked about like you didn't take anything with you. It turns off the mind and all the stuff, the emails you need to do and this thing you have to mail and whatever the things are that are running in the background, it just quiets them. Mm -hmm. And it allows you to be there with whoever you're with. I mean, that's, I mean, you and I are obviously drinking it today, but I don't do a podcast without it. And, and most of my guests, if they've never tried it, will try it. And it just allows for a deeper connection. Yeah. And that's, I think it, if there's a challenge out of this, it was just for, for parents thinking about when was the last time you were just super present with your kids that you weren't thinking about dinner. You weren't thinking about tomorrow. You weren't thinking about bedtime, bath time. You weren't thinking about emails. You weren't thinking about a trip you had to take. Like for myself, that's, that's a recurring like little check. Like am I, am I being present right now? Um, and that's what this unlocked for me, you know, a year ago. Yeah. So it, it's, you know, I've often talked to, to people about like, this is, if you're a golfer, there's, there's no better mm. companion out there because <laughs> most people like to drink on the golf course. This allows you to feel loose and feel really good, but you're like, your joy meter is kicked up a few notches. It just makes you happy, but not in a weird kind of druggy way. You're just happy. We're doing it right now, Cal. We're like, it's, it's snake oiling right now. Yeah. Like, but I'm like, I'm so trying to give to like, them rather, you know, we got a little yeah. more time here. So I, it's not yeah. like the 10 second, but it's so hard to, yeah. It's swing juice without the, the alcohol. Yeah. And yeah. you know, uh, and exercise. So like for myself, I don't work out without it. Never haven't done that in six, seven months where that, that like runner's high, that adrenaline and endorphin that you get where you're deep into a, a, a workout or deep into a session, it happens before I even start. Like I'm lacing up my shoes and I'm like, okay, here we go. You know, that feeling and that rate of perceived exertion is so much lower. Like I'm, I'm really excited. I'm going to push JW to try to get a study of, of that, like an RPE deal where someone's taking feel free and a placebo to see if it really is it, doing what I feel like it is. Um, it, it's pretty remarkable. And we've got some amazing athletes like real deal marathoners that take it for their long runs talking like number one, you know, masters marathoner in the world uses it, set a two minute PR in the, in the half marathon. And then former, uh, Boston marathon winner is, it takes it right now for long runs. And so there's, it just, again, the applic and I, I feel like there's other applications. Yeah. That well, we don't for even, those that of we you don't who do know. really like to drink, it's really good the next day when you're hung over. Oh, have a little food in your stomach because you have all that alcohol in there. So you want a little food in there to help settle the gut because yeah. there it is. It's, it's, it's a kava based um, tonic. It's 10 parts kava, one part kratom. So there is kratom in there. You know, there's like a lot of tension around kratom, but this kava is the root micro ground. The kratom is the leaf, so it's not an extract. I think it's important for people to understand. Mm -hmm. People starting to have issues with kratom when it's the extract. Think about, I think it's 51 or 53 alkaloids. I think that's the right word. In kratom, they extract two of them to come up with an extract. And then that's what people are using. We have all 51, 53 alkaloids in this. So you get the full spectrum mm -hmm. effect. And we're talking a couple of leaves versus a room full of leaves distilled and, you know, dried out and gasoline poured on it to create two ounces. Yeah. This is like, let's put it all in a, in a bowl, mortar and pestle, grind it up. And, you know, for better or for worse, that's what it tastes like too. It, I, I call it sweet dirt, yeah. um, <laughs> but the, the juice is worth the squeeze. And it's something that I honestly look forward to. And to the point of like, yeah, the morning after, if you're hung over or whatever, you don't ever have to be hung over ever again. That's right. <laughs> you know, I haven't, I haven't been. Yeah. Well, and, and, and so for people who haven't tried it, who are listening, um, botanictonics.com is where you can find it. You can either use Trey 40, T-R-E-Y 40, 
or unlearn 40 for 40% 40 off. Um, I believe those are going to, those are one-time codes. So if you find you like it, then just sign up for the, the subscription. It's 43% off. But um, if you try it, shake it, shake it really good because it starts to settle because it's the actual ingredients, you know, the root and the plant. You'll, you'll want to, I always start people off with like a third. Try a third of the bottle. Sometimes I would say a half, but you can always take more. Mm -hmm. But some people, it's, you know, some people, it, the, either the cava or the kratom doesn't agree with them. And so they get nauseous. Mm -hmm. So that can happen. If you're like super hungover, like be careful. That can have, we've, we've heard some I mean, instances. you can have like a banana and you're going to throw up. If you're yeah. Hungover. So don't blame it on this. Um, but yeah, start with a third. You should feel something in 15 to 20 minutes. And then you should be able to ride that for three, four, sometimes five hours. And you won't even know that you're not on it anymore. Such a gentle off ramp. Mm -hmm. And then if you want to have some more, you know, but it's really, you know, I always recommend people the first time to try it, have some food in your stomach because you haven't had this stuff before. So, um, you know, eventually you get to the point where you like to do it fasted. That's how I like to do it. Same. Right. Yep. But, but it's, it's got many applications. And it's got a brand new team member, Trey Hardy. Trey motherfucking Hardy. Yeah, man. I'm just so excited. And I, again, this is official, but I, yeah, JW doesn't even know that I'm, I'm in. <laughs> yes. <laughs> He's let's go. Uh, it's not like this is going to publish before I talk to him, but this is, yeah, the offer was a couple of days ago and, and I can't wait to get in there and, you know, get my hands dirty and just love, love on the team and, and help move this where, where JW wants it to go. Yeah. I love it, brother. Yeah. Um, I think you've got a call that was five minutes ago, so it'll be all right. We'll, uh, let's, let's wrap here. Let me see if there's, uh, there's anything else. All right. First, like, where can people find you? I'm, I'm on all of the, the social medias, except I really only check Twitter and Instagram. Okay. And yeah, if you, if you love looking at pictures of my children, you're going to love Instagram. And if you love track and field, you're going to love my Twitter, but pending this new position, it's about to be pretty feel free heavy. And I'll probably be more like science-based stuff that are, that's looking into the, the applications of these plants and these ancient plants and how they were used. And, um, I'm, and I'm, I'm an open book, like shoot, shoot me a message, love talking to people. Um, that feels, that's it, man. That feels like it. Yeah. I love you, Cal. I love you, brother. And I've been wanting to do this for like, ever since I met you and I started doing the podcast, I'm like, I need to have Trey on. Well, I'm glad I'm we waited because- Fucking so glad. <laughs> I'm glad we, now we had so much more to talk about. We're just, we're just both in the work and it just, yeah, it was, it was much richer. Yeah. This is the best. And for everybody listening, I, and whether you're a new listener or like an old listener, I know like how you feel sitting there in your car or wherever you are and you're hear, hearing Cal. And you're so jealous of where we are sitting right now and how powerful <laughs> this room is and what everything is and how Cal both has this amazing presence and holds space for his guests. That's not a thing for the podcast. That's who Cal really is. And I know he's got some good friends listening to it, but um, it's just an honor to be here with you. I remember the first time I heard it and was telling you, love, hey, love your podcast, keep it up. And you said, would love to have you on. I remember this imposter part of me that just is he does not want me on this show i know he doesn't and then when you when you finally when you did ask and it was like hey you got time i was so ready and 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 just honored to be to be asked and can't wait to do it again yeah dude. it'll be good perfect okay. thanks for those words I, that means a lot coming from you yeah and cal you're i've said it a bunch of times and you know what i'm about to say but cal you're a good guy mm. Trey, you're a good guy. I love you, brother.